you're tuned in to Girl Stop Playing, and I'm your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know that I'm bringing you the information and the conversations to help you make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. Mm -hmm. And on this week's episode, we got a working woman in the building. My girl needs no introduction. We got the beautiful, oh, badass, <laughs> bossed up Yandy in the I'll building. Hey, y'all. Hey, girl. Hey. Hey, girl. Hey. Y'all better stop playing. Listen, <laughs> we were finally able to get you in the studio. I'm, I'm so excited to, to have you here. So, Yandy, you don't know this, but I used to write for your magazine back in the day. <sighs> Everything Girls Love. Yes. Stop I was a writer it. way back when. So this is a full circle it is. moment. I'm excited to have you here. I'm glad to be here. And look at this. Look I at know, God. right? You didn't even know. So I wrote for EGL. We are connected in that way. I'm still very much connected. You had so many great people that were a part of the magazine, the team, yes. the staff. I'm still very much connected to a lot of the people. Um, so thank you for that opportunity because a lot well, of connections you. has come from that. Yes, even EGL was such an amazing start to kind of my foot in media. Yeah. I had no idea what I wanted to do with it but I knew that I had something I wanted to say and I also wanted to create a community of some women that had things to say so I'm so happy to hear you were part of it. Yes, yes. That's I so loved dope. that. I loved the mission, the platform. Um, you recently had an event mm -hmm. because you have relocated to Atlanta. So let's let's start there. When, okay. did you, when did you get to Atlanta? We came to Atlanta in 2020 like pandemic hit in March. Uh -huh. June, my husband was like, we out. And the crazy thing is I came kicking and screaming. You didn't want to come. I didn't want to come. So New York, you, were you in New York still? Yes. Mm -hmm. New York to me is like you love it or you hate it. It's either I don't ever want to go there or I don't ever want to leave. Yes. What did you not, I feel, and I'm on the, I'm on the hate it side. I feel really? like it's so hard. It's such a hard life in my opinion. I've never lived there. But when I go. You've never lived no, there. No, y'all got why. the bodega thing, the walk into the train, the riding of the train. So that's the, the easy thing for me. I would love to be able to come out my house, walk down a couple feet, and be at the bodega. Girl, that's not a couple feet. I have to feet. get in the car. No, no, for me, because oh, I grew you. up okay, in Harlem. Okay, okay. Literally, I walked out my building. Probably 15 steps was the supermarket. One step above next to that was the bodega. Then we had the Kennedy fried chicken. If I want to go to my girlfriend's house, I can walk a couple blocks. So I love just the convenience of being able to touch everything and everyone without having to drive. It's so funny. It's, perception is, is everything, right? Because your perception of your experience, you're the one that lived this experience, right? Your perception is it's so easy. My perception of someone who grew up in cities that didn't rely on public transportation, that you couldn't necessarily just get out and walk. Uh -huh. It's like, oh my God, that seems so hard. I could just go get in my car. I can just drive down the street. So I think it's so cool to hear like yeah. the different Girl, 30 pounds later, I wish I walked more. That part. And, and the crazy thing is when I went back to New York, I was like, babe, let's just take the train. Let's take the train. He was like, what? I'm like, I just want to take the train. All right, cool. Let's take the train. We missed the train. Yeah. That's we missed the, the, train. the life that you that you know. So do you do you go back often? Um, so here's the thing. I thought that I would be going back every weekend. I was like, let me get a place. I was like, let's just get a condo so that we can go back all the time. How about now I kick and scream not to have to go back? I only go back to New York if I'm paid to go there. Mm. If I'm booked, that's it. If I'm not booked, I'd be I love my house in Atlanta. We've opened up several businesses here, mm -hmm. so a lot of them thrive on the weekend, the restaurant, the skincare store. So I don't want to leave. And then the kids are in school during the week, so I'd be like, I ain't paying me, I'm not going. Yeah, so you definitely picked a very like iconic, historic location here in Atlanta for both of your businesses. Yeah. You invited me to be a part of the festival that you just had, and when we pulled up, I'm like, man, I, me and my husband were literally walking up because we got lost at first, and we <laughs> ended up like in the mall part. Uh -huh. And so we're like, man, can you just imagine when this was like at its height, the underground Atlanta, when this was like buzzing, you know, when it was like the place to yes. be, just the, the how historic the space is. So the fact that you came to the underground, um, you have two businesses right next door to each other, mm -hmm. which is genius. You're literally able to take advantage of the location and you yep. know the, mm -hmm. using one another to to leverage um, each other. What made you start skincare and restaurant? Were those things that you were already doing? What was 
what was the so so the I think any entrepreneur or any creator when you create something it's to solve a problem right mm -hmm. so for me Yale skincare was created during a time where I had two things going on I was suffering depression I had never gone through depression and recognized it um, and part of that recognition was how my skin and my body was behaving to what my mind was doing to me. Um, so I had dark spots, I had acne breakouts, my nose was peeling. I just looked bad. This was my second season on the show and I remember having to pop pimples because I didn't want to go on the show with the white heads and I'm like, then it would be a dark mark. So I would put tons of makeup so that you guys wouldn't see it or notice what I was going through. And I just felt like I got to a point where I was tired of doing that. I was tired of looking like that. And I was like, I got to do something. So I remember going into a really popular chain store. And I saw that, um, one, I didn't see representation. I kept saying, does this eye cream work for black girls? Is this going to get rid of these dark, dark circles? I'm like, is this going to help my um, dry skin around my nose peeling? And the fact that I had to repeatedly ask every time she brought something of the cleanser, the toner, the eye cream, and I had to say, you sure this works for brown skin? Um, that was a problem for me. And then when I got to the register, now look, I'm on TV and I know y'all think when you get on TV, you just automatically get rich. I wasn't. So when they started ringing stuff in, I had five pieces and it came up to almost $500. I was like, oh, that's the problem. The average woman that, you know, struggling to pay rent or whatever, she cannot also afford a 30 day supply of skincare at $500 mm -hmm. additional. So I was like, there's a white space for something that has representation of brown girls, brown people, um, that also is reasonable. And then I, I looked at the back and I'm like, I don't understand any of this on the back. What is this ingredient? I wanted to create something that was plant-based, that was all natural, and that, um, you know, I saw people of color represented. Mm -hmm. So that's why I started that. It was to make me feel better because I was going through a depression and I hated the way I looked. Um, and because of the stress, my skin was reacting to it. So it solved that problem. And then I also wanted to create something that solved the problem of the marketplace where we can go feel represented and then afford it. Mm -hmm. And it was a good ingredient. Now, Dancing Crepe was created. Um, okay, so there was my store and then there was a space next to me that at the time someone had under lease. And I was like, man, I just wish this space was open. I could expand the store. Um, and we bought the place during um, COVID and all that stuff that was going on during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I would love to have a place where people, once the world opens back up, where people can just convene and commune and get together. And I thought I would expand the skincare store. But like you said, this is a historic place. I didn't know that you can't break down walls. Nope. Can't break down walls, can't change the brick. Not supposed to paint the brick, didn't know that. I painted the brick. <laughs> um, what happens, do you get fined or something? So the thing is, they didn't put it in my lease. I had oh, no idea. Okay. I had no idea. Um, so later on, when they came to do the inspection, they were like, red flag. And I was like, nobody told me. Nobody told me. So I was able to get away with my painted bricks. Um, but then I realized I can't break down this wall. So let me think of something else that can bring people together. Um, I love to dance. And I love crepes. So I made dancing crepes. Dancing crepes. So I've when heard. You come so, to dancing listen, crepes. Yes, you gotta dance. You gotta dance. But there's something on the menu that all of the everybody talks about. It's these the, the seafood the, egg rolls. The egg rolls. The yes. seafood egg rolls. Yes. So we have seafood egg rolls that are lump crab meat, lump shrimp. Well, shrimp and lump lobster meat. Mm. So good. Is there cheese in them? So you can ask for cheese. And okay, then you but can I can get it without no, cheese. Oh yeah, you can okay, ask for okay, no cheese. Okay, okay, okay. We make everything at that restaurant. We make on the spot, so we don't have like a frozen stash of. of so egg rolls when we do in the freezer, no, we don't. Gotcha. We, we take the seafood meat, they chop it up, they put it in the roll, so you can get it made to order. You can ask for cheese or no cheese. Got gotcha. you. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So two businesses right next door to each other. Is the restaurant business as challenging as the people say? It's very challenging. It is. It is very challenging, and it is the truth. You do not make real money probably until you're in your first or second year. Mm. And I'll tell you why. So all of these permits and licenses and grease trap cleaning, and then you have so many fees that you have to, even the liquor license fee. You're going to walk in just liquor license fees. It's going to cost you upwards of ten grand. And is that that's not guaranteed that you're gonna get it, that's or is that guaranteed. after you like got approved? Don't have nothing in your past. Mm. 
don't ever have been arrested for anything. And it's crazy because when we were doing this, I was just fighting to get, because I had two felonies for protesting. Those were felonies? I got felony charges. I did. They didn't have to do that to me. The officers at the time were walking free with no charges that murdered Breonna Taylor. However, because I went and protested on Daniel Cameron's lawn and stayed, and they had to arrest me to make me leave, I got uh, felony trespassing and also attempting to, something about messing with the law, and t attempting to intimidate procedural law something or other. I don't know the term, I'm not mm. a lawyer. So yeah, I got two felony charges. So and did I, that come up with the liquor license application? No, because I had just got it. I had to show, it did come up, but I had to show that I got it thrown out. Okay, okay, okay. And it, I mean, I had to do community service and pay a fine, so I don't know if that's considered thrown out, but whatever, it was done away with, so I was able to get my liquor license. Got you, got you. Um, okay, so you mentioned being on TV, Yell Skin Care came because of something personal that you were dealing with. I love how you said this was the first time that you've been through it and recognized it. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is the key, because we be going through stuff. Oh, God, yes. We just don't recognize it. We can't diagnose it because yes. we, we haven't heard people talking yes. about it. We, you know, haven't talked to a friend that experienced something similar. Yeah. So many of us have experienced these things, were truly depressed, you just couldn't communicate what exactly. it was or describe it. I mean, I think as women, especially where we are, once you hit your 20s, 30s, 40s, you, um, you've been through heartbreak. You've been through a friend that has disappointed you. Your family may have disappointed you. You've started businesses or maybe you are a career woman and you got, you know, you reached that glass ceiling and you feel like I worked so much harder. All of those different things causes workplace trauma, you know, relationship trauma, um, and you internalize those things. Some people internalize it and they're like, you know what? Man's rejection is God protection and they push through. And some people feel like, why me? Why am I going through this? I don't want this. I don't want this struggle. And that's where I was. Mm -hmm. and, and constantly feeling like, why me? Not seeing a way out of it. Not feeling like anything is ever going to get better. Not ever feeling like I'll get through this. That was depression. How did you get through it? What did you say to yourself or do in that moment? I couldn't say anything. I could not say anything. I couldn't do anything. It was the village. It was not me. I did not have the capacity to do or say anything. Um, I remember, um, I got friends, man. Thank God for my friends and my manager, this woman, Latoya Bond. Um, hey, Toya. Yes. You gotta get out the bed, Yandy. You got it. You gotta get out. You're gonna get through this. And I was like, No, I'm not. I'm never gonna get through this. You're gonna get through it. You will. Constantly telling me that, and I'm like, No. And then even having friends come over, turning on the lights. Come on, get up. Walking me to my shower, taking off my clothes, washing me, like that, like that. Meanwhile, trying to be on TV, trying to save face so they don't know what's going on or how I'm really feeling. Um, and not even really being able to turn on the lights. And then on top of that, I had a newborn, and I was breastfeeding. And you know, when your body and is not functioning right because your mind's not functioning right, you can't create milk. So that was another thing. I got a newborn, and I'm not even able to do what I need to do for my newborn. That <sighs> There's no feeling like you can't mm. feed your child. Ooh. That, baby? That's looking in your baby's face. I mean, there's no, I've, I've never cried on this podcast and today's not gonna be the day. Yes. But there's no feeling mm. like putting your breast in your child's mouth and nothing comes out. Oh my God. And knowing, and it's, it's such a difference when I was able to. It's different <laughs> that when, part. like you sit there and the, some people in the hospital, you're trying, you're trying, and the, the doctors are like, it will come, don't worry. Or, and some people just it never happens. But when you know that this is the only way your baby knows how to eat, I've never given my baby formula at that point. My baby, of course, wasn't eating any food or, you know, that's all that's my baby it. had to survive. And I didn't Why know. Why can't my body do this? That's a thing. And it is not talked about. It was, and that is what layered on top of whatever I was going through. And that was the ultimate. And then it just got to be like, I can't do that, right? Why, mommy, I, my mother lived, at that time, I lived in a, a condo. My mother lived four floors above me. I was like, mommy, please, I can't do it. That is, is, is nothing worse than that feeling, nothing worse. But nothing having that worse. support and being vulnerable enough, and I don't know if you were you vocal about what you were going through, but 
having people around you who, even if you're not vocal, they can see it on I you. I wasn't vocal. They can smell it on you like, sis, no, nah, something is wrong. I wasn't vocal, but it was it was the type of thing you couldn't hide, mm -hmm. right? I remember my mom came downstairs, and she was like, get up, get up. And I was like, I can't. She's like, just get on your knees. You don't got to go far. Just get on your knees. You got to pray through this. You got and she kept saying, there will be tomorrow. There will be to next year. This will be your tomorrow and it'll be something else for you to worry about. And I just could not see past that moment. And I remember her just getting on my, getting, get, making me get on my knees, grabbing my hands and just pray. I couldn't even pray, I was so depressed. And she had to just pray, pray over me and for How me. How do you deal with that and then do this? <clears throat> how, do you, how do you do that? And get in front of somebody's camera and be Yandy? I don't know who I was, I wasn't Yandy. Um, because there are moments when the cameras stop and I, you know, if I had to sit and talk to, I think at that time I was talking to Tara or talking to whomever, Kim or Juju, whoever I was talking to. Okay. And they're telling me about what they're going through. And you know, I'm talking about some surfacey level, whatever I'm going through. And the minute they're like, okay, we have to reshift. I didn't want to talk. I didn't wanna, and you could just see it just drain from me the minute the cameras went off. All right, okay, we're getting ready to go back in. Kinda pull it together. Okay, yeah, and you know, yesterday at that party, it was crazy, oh my gosh, I can't believe such and such yelled or such and such threw that drink. Girl, oh my gosh, crazy. Cameras went down. And I would literally just walk off set. I didn't, I didn't even say goodbyes. I take my mic off, get in the car, go home, take off my clothes, get my baby, and get in the bed. That's it. Almost as if like you were a shell of yourself. Yep. I just came to perform. And mm. I think, you know, I remember being young, having to go perform for school. You know, I, I remember um, dealing with a parent that was addicted for a long time and um, seeing things happening at home knowing that I shouldn't see certain things and just going to school and performing. So that came second nature to me, being able to just be like, I'm in school now or I'm shooting now. But the minute I walked through my doors at home or the minute I walked through my doors, you know, later on when I got older, it was, okay, let me deal. So that was, I mean, it was somewhat easy because I had got used to doing mm -hmm, things mm -hmm. like that. Cope your coping mechanism. Yeah. And dealing with it however yeah. you knew how, but it wasn't the healthiest way because yeah. you weren't actually dealing with it. You were just kind of putting up with it. Putting you a band-aid under over the rug. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. yep. Putting on a perfect face. And I think it's so there's so much riding on how you appear on these shows because people are so damn rude, mean, ugly, just mean spirited. I can't imagine dealing with what you were dealing with internally, but then having to publicly mm -hmm. deal with people's comments and opinions. Oh my gosh, and, and the comment was commenting. There were so many comments, so many. And, and for those that don't know, but I'm talking about the time when my husband was on trial and we publicly, you know, I was going with him to the court cases. I just, Amir was two months when the feds came, that's my son, when the feds came to my house. And as much as I wanted to hide it, I was on a whole freaking TV show. And I was like, it's gonna catch up to me. They're gonna find out, so I might as well be the one to tell them. Did you try to hide it? Oh no, so you didn't even, you were like, let me just, let me tell y'all before you find out. So when they came to my house that day, I think I was supposed to shoot later that day. Of course I couldn't shoot. We were going through all of that. Um, so I told the producers at the time, um, was I a producer then? I don't even know, I don't even, can't even think back if I was still a producer at that time. But I remember talking to Mona who at the time was like a partner, a mentor, a friend. She used to be my boss, but at this time, I had stopped working for her. And um, I, I told her what happened, and I was like, do not tell anyone at all. And she was like, okay, are we covering this on the show? I was like, no, we cannot cover this on the show. Did you feel some type of way she asked you that? Um, I didn't feel the type of way because that's, we. That's my life. It was That's my life was. that was happening in the moment. And you sign up for these shows to show your real life. So I was just like, let me process, you know, let me process all that's happening. Um, this is my best friend, my man, the father of my new baby dealing with this. And then I also knew that at that time I had EGL, which is everything girls love. We were heavy in the mentoring young girl space. 
um, I had all these young women that were working for me or that, that looked up to me. And I was like, how do I put one foot in front of the other? And, you know, I didn't know what the perception was going to be of me. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you are connected to someone that has to go through the justice system for any reason, there is a target. It's like the scarlet letters on you now, too. So I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know, you know, if the feds were going to look into, which they did. They looked into all my finances, the things that I owned. And I had no idea how things were going to play out. Even though I knew that I did everything by the book and I did everything right, I was at that time somewhat familiar with how this justice system works for people of color. And I didn't know, you know, I was successful. Um, I had been in the music business for a long time at that point. And I just didn't know how things were going to pan out for me. So I was like, no, you cannot follow this. Let me just process what I'm going through. Um, so after about a month of me having to just figure this out, I was like, it ain't no way. Blogs were starting to like hint at things. And I was like, ain't nobody telling, cause I started seeing all kinds of crazy stuff. I was like, nobody gonna tell this story for me, you know, and, and I know the truth. Mm -hmm, I'd rather mm -hmm. just tell the story and let them see the other side. Like, you, you know, they, they'll show these images of, you know, people going to jail and you see the guys with the hands or women you don't see the other side so often of what that does to the children people that are left behind what that does to the mother mm -hmm. what that does to that that you know whomever that community of people that raised you or, or fall for you and, and sometimes like in my husband's case some of these charges are well after you know that, that was something from six and a half years ago before I even was with him mm -hmm. and I'm like dag why is this my fate now you know, we built a life together. We built a family. I don't want. I don't got nothing to do with that. Right. This is affecting my life. Um, and and you know, I had to. I felt like I would do the world a disservice by not letting them see what my life is going to be like as a single mother. Do you think that the show agitated it, the situation at all, or do you think they just were truly just documenting what was happening? Um, documented. What What do you mean? Do Do I feel like they agitated? Do you feel like they were, um, they they made it more than it had to be? They showed it in a light that they didn't have to. They no, not not that situation, not okay. at all. Um, I mean, they showed my husband. They they showed us driving to turn himself in. They showed him saying goodbye. I think Little Man DC was six or seven at the time. That was literally the morning he was going to turn himself in, and at that time. Um, he was turning himself in. We didn't know how for how long. We didn't. And this is before the bond here. This is before we had no idea of anything. And the newspaper was saying he's facing ten to twenty five years based on nothing, based off of what you know the the, the charges were. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't know. We really just did not know. So even me, you know, looking at him kiss this seven-year-old, and then seeing him hug. And I remember Amir was crying, crying, crying. He was only, at this time, by the time my husband turned himself in, I think Amir might have been four months. I think it took two months before he actually turned himself in. Kissing Amir goodbye. Um, and Amir was crying profusely, just crying. And I was just trying to hold it together because Little Mendeecee is looking at me. I'm trying to be strong for my husband. And I was in shambles on the inside and it was real the show like they knew that he had to turn himself in I think like by 8 o'clock in the morning so the camera guys and the producers got there at like 5 so they saw us getting up getting dressed me cooking breakfast so this was like me literally cooking my last breakfast for my husband for, at that time he wasn't my husband but for my boyfriend right cooking my breakfast seeing him kiss the babies all of that was just like it was just that so much that seems so traumatizing Andy it to, was to go through it Period. Yeah. To go through it on camera. To go through it, maybe have a little bit of closure, and then it comes out on TV. That was the worst part of it all. That part. It's like, I got to relive this. Yep. And y'all got to see it. And you going to ask me questions about it. And I'm going to see you talking about it. And you going to have opinions. And yep. 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 And the blogs. Oh, my gosh. The, there's one particular blog that to this day, I still, like, if I see them on the red carpet, I'd be like, mm -hmm, nope, thanks. I'm good. I ain't fucking with you. I ain't forget. It, I ain't forget. And, and it was, she was so 
mean and horrible and the things that she would say oh that's good for nothing you know he, people like him and she should have known better Don't, did she go to Howard you would think Howard would give her a better education you're talking about the father of my child these are you're real about people the person that I love. these are real people I mean horrible and then like look I always like the first episode of ours on the show was at a baby shower I was pregnant and he's like I'm going with Vado to this party you know I'm managing Vado I gotta go do this and I'm like I got this big old belly we got all these gifts he's like your father's gonna help you do that and you know some of that kind of stuff is situational because he actually did help put the stuff in a U-Haul um, but it was a party that he was going to that they were following so they had cut all that stuff out and they followed that so she's like I knew he was good for nothing when he left her at that baby shower to deal with it by herself he's a good for nothing no I was like, oh my gosh. So when I say did the show agitate it, that's what I meant. It's the oh. show knows the whole story, but they want to show, oh, well, he left her and didn't. Re <laughs> you know, that's what I feel like. Is there a lot but of the that crazy that goes thing on? is The crazy thing is when that was shot, because the, the whole having to go away didn't come out to towards the end of that season. So when that episode was probably shot and cut, they didn't, they even, didn't even know, know this that was, was coming. coming. They didn't know that was coming. Um... So did it agitate, make him look a little like he ain't care? Yes, it did for sure. And he's he's super caring. Um, but I think that was just, you know, sometimes they want to paint these men as having a million things going yeah. on. Um, they had no idea what was to come, you know, so I can't blame that on the show. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's hard. The comments are hard. The perceptions are hard. The assumptions are hard. And definitely these blogs and people with the comments and all that, will break you down even more. I had to log off and turn it off. I had to just mute the noise. Do you what do you, what do you do now? What's your coping mechanism with the comments now? Well, if I see myself even if it's good, right? If they're like, you know, who wore it best or Yandy stunt whatever it is, I don't even read the comments. You don't even want to Oh god, no, not about me. I'll, you know, tune in somebody else's stuff. But when they could go and talk about, I think Beyonce is perfection. Perf you know, I think Rihanna is perfect. When I can see comments where they going in on her and the way they used to go in, they go, they, they, they go in on my baby Amir's hair. My baby loves to wear his hair out and big. That's it. They be and talking about your baby? My baby's hair. My baby's hair, yes. So I'm like, girl, they talk about Blue Ivy's hair. And she's fierce, okay? Baby got Grammys, okay? So this is the kind of thing that is just like, you know, you got to just... I've learned, and I think Mona might have said this first, if you don't know them personally, don't take it personal. Mm. That's it. So, one, I don't read if I see myself. So those of you that are out there that go in when you see me just because you don't like me, and that's fine. Just know that I don't even see your comments. I ain't okay? reading that shit no way. You performing for everybody else because I don't see it. I don't read it. I don't read it. I don't see it. That is so mature of you. Yeah. I, I, I got to protect my mental health. I got to protect my space. I don't want to be thinking I'm ugly. She got a big nose. Her feet look ugly. And then, Her, girl, tap on that profile. Because what? Man, who, but where you get your contacts ma from? I mean, how long you going to You never going to switch the color of those contacts? Zach, those con contacts are so played out. This is what I hear. Every, every day I hear this. Now, on my page, I read the stuff. So if you come to my page, I might tell you a little about yourself too, if you say <laughs> something negative. <laughs> Like, I've, I've had to say so many times, like, they're not contacts. My baby boy, since he was a baby, he's had, why would you put contacts in your baby's eyes? My baby don't have contacts. So I guess when it's silly little things like that, that it's just like, this has no merit, then I could see you being like, girl, okay, I'm not even gonna worry about right. that. Right. Yeah, because y'all are just tripping, minding my business. When all of the things were coming down um, with Mendeecees, did you ever want because y'all weren't married, mm -hmm. was there ever a question of you holding him down while he was gone? Yes, every day. Every day. I didn't expect you to say that. You wanted me to lie? No, I didn't expect that to be your truth. Every day, it was hard. It was hard going on those visits. It was hard going on those five-hour drives after my club hostings or booking from here to there, speaking engagements and driving because I wanted to make sure my baby saw him often, um, like on the weekends often. Um, Valentine's days were super hard. My birthdays were hard. Christmases were hard. Halloween, How long was he going in total? Trick was hard. Collectively, like five years. Oof. Andy. Yeah. Hard. 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 And you out here in the free world having all of the opportunities. I saw his interview, Club Shay Shay. Oh, yes. Yes, Uncle Shay Shay. And he's like, yo, she out here living her best life, and I'm sitting up here locked up. My and, freedom and is gone. And do you believe he said that? Yo. At the time, in the moment, yo, he's like, yo, yo what are you doing? Oh, 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 word. 
a word? You want to do Bible with your friends? Oh, for real? Mm, all right, cool. What's the problem, sir? What's so were wrong? y'all button heads or w- you were? So he was serious about this. Yes. Were you like, but bro, you want me to sit down like I like I did something? How were y'all navigating that space, and then you not going out here and wilding out? Like you it really was, staying committed to it, this process? Every every week, I was. I'm not gonna say every day. Every week there was a conversation. What would you like me to have been doing? What would you like me to have been doing? Um, would you? Do you want me to be miserable? What do you want? No, I want you to be happy. But I'm just saying, do you want me not to post it? Would that make you happy? Would you prefer me to cry? Would you prefer me to be on Instagram crying? Or should I show me being happy and living life the best I can? What do you want me to, what do you want me to do for your children? What should they do? Should they see me crying? Should they see me upset? Should they see me sad? And he would get it, especially once I made it to that visit. It's all good once I'm on a visit. It's great, right? The visits were great. Um, but when he had to see me living life or see me trying to cope with him being gone or cope with being a single mom, it was hard. It that was hard. Part. The it was kids. Hard. I always think about the kids. You you toting the baby. I, I can imagine. two car seats. Girl, I got two car seats right now. Don't nobody know the struggle of Yo, two car seats. Yo, imagine two car seats and grocery shopping. It's Oh, I know. It's a, it is my... Well, Yo, no, I'll be... I'm girl, not going to say this now because my kids, kids are good Jesus. and healthy, but I literally would have to run upstairs with the two car seats, leave the babies in the house by themselves. Yeah, and go back down back and get the groceries. Get yep. the groceries. Run back up. Yes. Those are the things. When you become a mom, you like how do you how do you do these things? How do you live your life now? No, y'all wasn't gonna see that on Instagram, so y'all could talk about that too. That part, but it's real because some of y'all had to do it too. But y'all would have sat and judged me like, how could she do that? That two year old could get out that car seat, got that two year old locked up. He could take the new baby, baby. out, throw the baby up. You gotta do what you gotta do. You gotta out do here. what you gotta do and pray. You gotta have faith. You gotta pray that God got your back. God protects babies and fools, and I done been both. Still. 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 Still am today. I'll be like, damn, I know I'm not a baby, so I must be a damn uh, But fool. I am a baby to somebody. Right. Somebody out there, honey. God's I'm a baby, baby. to them, Thank too. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Did the people judge you? Did people expect you to not hold him down? Did people... Of course. St- okay, not the people, though. What about your people? What was your so, people's so, response? So my people, the main people, were like, Why? They didn't why get would it. you hold him why, down? Or why, why? Why would you put yourself? Why would you sign up for this? Why would you continue? Why are you putting yourself through this? Why are you driving up there? Why are you dealing with those phone calls? Why? Why? Why are you doing this? And my only answer was, I love him. It's the right thing to do. I, I didn't have like, you know, the Bible said I didn't. That wasn't my thing. I loved him, and I knew it was the right thing to do. Did love have a limit? If they would have said. 15 and not five. What was your limit? When they said, when I thought it was one, it was too much. When I thought it was five, I thought it was too much. When I thought it was three, they gave him eight. And he did five of the eight. You know, all of that was too much. It was too much. I ain't gonna sit here and say it wasn't too much. Um, I, I look back and I, and I think it was, I also, just like college for me, like once I commit to something, and I, and I say I'm going to do it. I felt like I wanted to do it. And then I also felt like this is a drop in the bucket. Like we, I committed a life to this man. This is a drop in the bucket of the life we have together. God willing, we live to our old age. This is a drop in the bucket. And I would have to tell myself all the time, this moment in time will not be my forever. And Lord knows I would have shot myself in the foot had I seen that man walk up, that fine ass man that I loved, walk out of them doors and go to somebody else, knowing I wanted him, I would have been mad at myself. Did y'all have conjugal visits? Nope. He was in the feds. What the fuck? Yeah, I got so many other questions. We got, I'm going to have to ask you later because what? Wait, five years? You find other ways to be intimate through phone. Through, you just find other ways on visits. You find, we could talk about that off okay, camera. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about off camera. You find other ways. Okay, so there's other things that the people are doing. I was wondering, because that seems pretty tough. And people are just, you know, I I uh, consider myself to be a pretty private person, and I can just imagine, like, we judge ourselves. Yeah. Our people around us judge us, but to be judged publicly on a platform, on television, Mm -hmm. I can just imagine what it does, you know, to your self-esteem. Yep. What would you say is the hardest part of 
living this life? Is it doing it under a microscope? Um, I would say having to perform, although I told you before it came easy to put on a face when I was going through things, but my natural, I don't like to do my hair. I never do my nails. <laughs> I rarely get my feet done. Thank God I have the man that I have because he is like, baby, I love you natural. You ain't got to do none of that. Just make sure you shower every day, twice a day. I'm good. <laughs> um, but he doesn't, he, makeup is not his thing. He loves my hair when it's in an afro. He don't care about my feet being, you know, polished and all that stuff. Thank God. Because that is the real me. If I could wear a t-shirt and sweatpants every day, I would. Yeah, do you be so fly? I don't believe that. I'm telling you. You're forcing the fly? I am forcing the fly. It is a hard, it is not easy for me. Well, you look me. good doing it. Thank you. It's not easy for me, though. Like, it's so not easy. Like, I be having to, like, figure out, out like, it's hard to figure out this and to match this and to this, that. So my hairstylist, Brian, who's also my best friend, he is also my pseudo stylist because he be like, all right, Yandy, wear this with this. But he he's a fashionista. So he be like, put this together, put this together. And thank God, he pretty much lives with me. So he just pulled the outfit out for me. That's what you're wearing today. I'd be like, come Thanks. on, blessing. That's a blessing right there. He'll be like, do you have to do all of that for yourself on for the show, or does the show do that for you? No. You you're have doing to do, all of that on you're your You're doing all that. All that. They'll send a makeup artist to you. That's it. They're not doing your hair. They ain't getting you no clothes, no wardrobe. None of that. None of it. And then I work for real, right? So I be at my store working. I can't do all this. I be at the restaurant running back and forth. So you know I got on my Uggs or I got on some Crocs or something. I can't have no heels, serving tables, walking back and forth. Sometimes I'm flipping chicken in the kitchen, making crepes. Sometimes I'm the DJ, karaoke night. I'm the singer. Really working, working. I'm the host. I be working, working. So, yeah, I don't have time for the hair and the makeup and the nails and the this and the that. But you're still doing the show. I am still right? on the show. Still on the show. Mm -hmm. Can we go back to first season real quick? Yeah, 14 years later, I'm still on the show. So first season, I was a producer. I wasn't on camera first How season. How did it all come together? Let's go back even before season one. So we go, go way, way back. Way, way back. So we go way, way back. What happened was I met um, the VP of um, reality TV. His name was Jim Ackerman. And at the time, my client, Jim Jones, was on this show called The White Rapper Show. And backstage, while he was doing his thing in the front of stage, I was backstage, you know, doing what I do, networking, trying to get things for my client. And um, so I'm talking to Jim, and I'm like, Jim, I got this client. He's crazy. And I was like, his family, them together, they even crazier. I was like, if you want to see something good on reality TV, put his camera on, put his family on the camera. So he's like, okay, get me, get me some footage. You know, make me a sizzle reel. I had no idea what any of that was. So I went. It was one weekend. We were going away, and then I had um, Mama Jones and Christy get on camera, and I had my friend Yolanda Gerald, who I love to death, put together this footage for me. Um, she was, at the time, VP of video at Atlantic Records. I had an office at Atlantic Records. And she put together this sizzle reel that was awesome. It was awesome. And we named it Keeping Up With The Joneses. And I was like, this is fly, I love it. We are going to get this show. Took that up, got the deal. I got a development deal for Keeping Up With The Joneses. So it was great. We're shooting the show, everything is going, they seeing how crazy my client is and all the crazy stuff he's into us, running out of clubs, us doing all kind of crazy stuff. Um, it was great. And then um, life started lifing. You know, we had an artist that we loved dearly. His name was Stack Bundles, he got murdered. Mm -hmm. Then another one of Jim's artists, Max B, got sentenced to some crazy amount of time, like 60 to 70 years or something. And reality TV, of course, they want to capture that. They're like, okay, we're gonna capture you going to Stack Bundle's funeral. We're gonna capture you, you know, following Max B, um, you know, going to his first court date. And Jim was like, no, like yeah. this was real heavy emotional stuff for him. And um, for me as a producer, and I'm like, Jim, this is what they need. Like we're shooting this show. So we were constantly like this. And he's like, you need to get these cameras out my face. And I'm like, this is what we signed up for. To the point where he started, Literally pushing the, pushing the cameras out his face. And they were like, okay, maybe we do not need to shoot Jim anymore. It was too intrusive for him, he felt. So then I remember one day going at the time, Mona and I were very close. And uh, I no longer worked for her at that time. But I was like, Mona, I'm going to lose this deal. I'm going to lose this deal. And um, I need help. I don't want to lose my deal. And I think she was pitching a show about women and hip-hop with another network. And we were like... 
we sat at dinner and we're like, okay, maybe if there's a way that we can combine, you know, the deal that I have, mm -hmm. we combine your idea and I can have Jim and his family kind of be like, um, you know, not the, the all family. Maybe we have an ensemble cast. And that was the birth of Love and Hip Hop. That was the birth of it. So first season, I was behind the scenes, working in the story rooms and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, then I left to go on tour with Missy. But by the time I came back, we were ending the first um, season. And, um, you know, Mona did a great job producing that first season because I was gone for most of it while I was on tour with Missy. And um, that was the birth of Love and Hip Hop. Random question. Is that the... Is that is Missy the you and Mona connection? Because Mona was Missy's manager, uh -huh. right? Yep. Okay, okay. I was I, trying to I piece was, it together. I was Mona's intern Got when I got you. out of college. Okay. So I worked with Missy. Out of I Howard. worked with Bust out of Howard. I worked with Missy. I worked with Busta. Worked with Fifty. Worked with anybody that was on Violators roster. Tweets. Um, Noriega Capone. I'm um, Prodigy Mob Deep. Girl, so started as an intern. Yeah. Wow. Sure did. And now you're here now. Started from the bottom. Now. Started what from was the, bottom the what was here. the goal when you got that internship? What did Yandy want to be? I wanted to go to law school to be an entertainment lawyer. Shut your mouth. Promise and here you. you are. So this was not even a part of the that plan. Was not, and Mona will tell you, um, I had got asked. I was going to I applied for law school. I took my LSATs, did well, got accepted. And then Mona was like, "Okay, I have this tour. It was the Ladies First Verizon tour." Now. Well, you probably don't know because you're young, but that tour Am I young? Thank was you. Missy, Beyonce, to Girl, who am I not gonna know? Name somebody. No, I'm not just gonna saying know. you might not know that tour. Oh, okay, okay, okay. The okay, tour. Okay. It was, a, it I was, was like, a I know huge, all of these people. It was no, no. It was a huge tour okay. for women. I don't even I don't know that remember. there's been right. another tour okay. like that. But it was Missy, Beyonce, um, Tamia, Alicia Keys. I want to say. Um, Little Mo did some dates as well, but it was a huge tour. It was amazing. And she's like, you know, you can go on this tour with me and help me out, or you can, because I was going to quit and go to law school and intern like on my free days. And I was like, baby, I'm going on tour. Opportunity of a lifetime. My mother was like, what? What do you mean? And I was like, you know, I was like, I think this is, I said, instead of going to law school or grad school, I think this is my grad school over here. And I wasn't even really getting paid. I was getting paid $100 a week. Shut up. $100, $100 a week, okay? $100 a week, and I was touring the world. I was. I was getting $100 a week. Um, I think by the time I went on tour, I got per diem and then maybe $200 a week. But So those of you out there that want to know, do we grind? We, I was grinding. I ain't get here easy. So what was your first pay pay? Paid? Cause that was like play play. Where did it go from intern? Um, from intern, I became like a junior. I became Mona's assistant. Okay. Um, and I got a paycheck as her assistant. And then when I went on tour, that next time I went on tour, I was getting um, a percentage of the percentage of the percentage. Got you. But that was good for me. Got you. Got you. I was a cut happy. of the cut of the cut. Okay. A cut of the cut of the cut. So this was not this Yandy, name and lights was not a part of the vision. Was no. wife and mother always a part of the vision? Wife, yes. Mother was l somewhere long down the line when I'm 40. Got you. So that that I was, was like not a, in a rush. A to one be, day, but not a today. A one day, but not a today. Not even a wife. One day, not today. Because I was so excited. By the time I started getting my own management clients, like my first client was Jim Jones, right? And then I started doing so many other artists. And I was like, I was on the, I was on tour with him sometimes three months, two months, six months. Um, you know, my life was not my mm -hmm, life. Mm -hmm. So waking up, trying to make sure he's good, making sure the businesses were good. Then I was working at Atlantic Records. I had no time to think about being a real girlfriend. So I had a boyfriend. I had I mean, DC. I had just several a little roster. I had, had, little, had a couple different things happening at that time. Um, but one thing I was not doing was I was not fraternizing with anybody I've ever worked with. When I started first season, um, People was like, yeah, I know you and Chrissy got it going on because you mess with Jim. When I tell you, me and Jim ain't even hug. Like, it was so, our relationship was like real bro. Like, we was bros, right? It was no nothing. Like, we didn't even look at each other like that in no possible way to even be like, come here, let me hug you. It was like, so get out of here. I definitely want to ask if y'all really had beef or was that like a reality beef? Jim and I? No, you and Chrissy. So the crazy thing is, the way it started was her saying, Let's act like we got beef. 
shut up. Yeah, and I was like, absolutely not. Because I always knew that if I acted as if I had beef with you and, and, and it got disrespectful, I really couldn't say what I want to say acting because Jim would get mad and then that's my client that's my bread and butter so I was like this acting is going to be one way because you're going to be able to say what you want to say to me and then I'm going to take it I'm going to have to just take it I'm going to have to eat that and that's not my personality so I'm like nah I'm good um, and I'm silly right so my personality is to be silly so I think when the opportunity came for like little things like oh, you know here's a mother-in-law book like get along with your mom i didn't think that was bad i'm like here i want you and my mama jones was my girl so i was like i want y'all to get i want y'all to be good um and then when the song came on that mama jones made i was like ah eh. you know i thought that was funny i'm thinking she gonna laugh because we was laughing all the time she did not laugh she ain't laugh she ain't funny. so that was real beef okay it but became the crazy real beef. thing is that was the same day she said to me let's act like we got beef so it kind of i don't think it would have been beef if I wasn't like, I'm not doing that. I thought it was, a, it, it looked like an avenue for her to act like she was mad at something. Cause we used to play all the time and snap on each other, be silly with each other, just not on TV. Right. So I was like, girl, you're not, my whole attitude all the time was like, girl, you're not really serious. You really mad? You mad, mad? And then when the cameras go down, I'm like, you acting or you mad? What you doing? And was um, she mad? It was like, let me just keep this up. Cause I already said I'm not doing it for real. So it was like, let me act like I'm mad. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into a real thing. like. Oh, now we really beefing. Oh, oh okay. you did. Mm, interesting. It got interesting. Did, this mm. is my last reality TV question, because I feel like we always see what we see, but then we always hear like the residual effects of real life yeah. that reality TV has. Have you experienced any real life, I guess, challenges as a, as a direct effect of you being on reality TV? Like your real relationships? Um, you know, I would say yes. And no. And the reason why I say yes is because I think real relationships, you you cannot break those with money. You can't break those with, I made a mistake and I said that. You can't break those with um, slip ups. Like you work through it in real relationships. I'm gonna work through, I have friends that I've had since elementary school, the majority. Like I, I haven't, I don't lose friends. In TV, I lost f uh, somebody that was dear to me mm because it was TV time and I thought it was real, but when you don't perform the same way, like I'm not able to, you know, get you these deals or I'm not able to get you back on the show cause you know, they're no longer interested or I'm not able to, like when I wasn't able to perform in a way that suited our friendship, then I was no longer needed and my heart was broken. I mm. couldn't believe, so then it was again, well, let me act like I got beef with you. And I'm like, I don't want to do this with you. I love you. I don't want to have beef with you because this beef, you know how they say the thin line between love and hate? That was that for me. Like, I really love you, love you. Like, I love your children. I love your husband. I love you. So if we beef, I'm going to hate you because I love you. So that broke my heart. That mm -hmm. broke my heart. And I realized, you know, as I matured, and got, I'm like, that wasn't a friendship. It was one-sided. I was one sided. That, so this whole conversation of adult friendships has just come up, come up, come up, come up, come up. And that what you just said is what I feel like is on the backside of any friend breakup. It's like, well, yeah, you know, you start doing the math and you start thinking back, rolling down memory lane. And then you like, like, wait, I was we're doing we're this? really friends. I was also doing this. I was also making sure this happened. I was also making sure this didn't happen. And then I look back like, wait a minute. I never got protected in this. No one ever came to my rescue when this was happening. I was never, you know, made sure that the secrets were kept secret. I was not. It was like everything was fair game when it came to me for the sake of TV, mm. for the sake of let me make sure my spot is secure. And when that spot wasn't secure, it was like, now I'm going to come for you because that's going to get my spot back. Mm. If I act like I don't like you, now I'm back on TV. Mm. Or now I'm. So it was like, yo, you really took it that far? And that's when I realized, like, we really not Snap. friends. All this time I was loving you. I'm a damn fool. I've All had the plenty time of those that I was like, loving you. You was busy. Hmm. That it was that that and that is as painful. Well, I don't want to say as painful because people deal with things differently, but that can be as painful as a romantic relationship. Yeah. And sometimes more painful yeah. depending on you know the history, it was how much of my business you know, it was painful. the things we've been through together, all yep. of those things. Yeah, it's tough. It was. Another thing that's really tough, 
that I can relate so much to you with. We did the sesh. Shout out to Pinky. Hey, Shout girl. Out to Pinky. One of the things that that came up in the conversation was like mom guilt. Mm -hmm. Was running around town doing all of the things, going after our goals, being these superheroes, and struggling to not beat ourselves down for the way that we mother. Yeah. How has your experience been managing? Because I think balance is like bullshit. I don't yeah, really think that exists. Sure. But managing all of the things. Yeah. Having to show up and be the Yandy that so many people need, but then also finding time to be the mom that your children yeah. need. Yeah. Um, I had to just relinquish the thoughts and fight my brain on the whole mommy guilt idea. Balancing is a lie. It's a myth. It doesn't exist. Um, prioritizing exists. Um, being deliberate with your time and intentional with your time exists. And that's what I had to do. I had to just really be intentional with the conversations I have with my children. Listen, I got to go away. But I'm going away to do this, that, and the third because you want to go to that camp, right? You want to make sure you go to acting school and you want to be in football and mommy and daddy have to work if that's what's going to happen. And then... If you have questions about mommy's work, you can come with me. You can travel with me, but you're gonna have to sit and be good. I put up a post the other day. Um, I was like, Amir, I'm gonna take you with me to work because he has so many questions about why I can't do this and why I can't bring him here and why I can't run around with him and his friends, take him to the swimming pool. I said, you're gonna come with me to work so you can see why. I took him to the Yale store. From the Yale store, we went to the restaurant. I had him serving tables with me. From there, I had to speak an engagement, I had to get in hair and makeup. I went, shout out to E.T. Thomas. Um, I went to the hip hop preacher. He had me booked and Amir came with me there. And then from there, we had to go back to the restaurant because it was packed. Um, and he came home like, Mommy, please just leave Not me alone. Now, whoa, out. Whoa, out. Laid on the couch like I can't do anything more. And I said, well, welcome to my life. So, so, you know, when I get home at night and you're like, Mom, can you come play the video game with me? Mom, I need you to, Mom, can you wash my hair? Mom, and I'm like, this is why sometimes I'm like, Mom, I mean, I could do one thing. I got Pick one. I got 40% of me left. You got, you got it. What you want it to be. It's the one thing. Because then you also need dinner. So I had to just realize that mommy guilt is something that's going to hold me back from doing the things that I need to do to be able to take care of the kids. From doing the things that I need to do to be able to do to take care of myself mentally. Because I got to do it at this mm -hmm. point. I done signed up for it. I done committed myself to it. I got to do it. So I just tried to infuse my home life, my children, my husband into everything that I have going on. Give them some buy-in, I yeah. think. Because I, I think a lot of times when you leave the house, especially for kids, they they have literally no clue what you do when you walk out that door. They think you out there playing. Yeah. You're out there having fun oh, they without do. them. Oh, they do. And it's like, no, this is how this exists. Mommy yep. has to leave this house to yep. go do something. But yep. I think it's such an important conversation to have because postpartum, mom guilt, I mean, just superwoman syndrome, so many things that we deal with, but we just deal with it. Yeah. And it's like, I'm the only one dealing with it. It's like, yeah. no, we're all going through these things. Yeah. I always say like motherhood is like that hood that it's like, I see you. Mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah. If, if, don't nobody else get it. A mama is going to get it. Yeah. So you going to feel me when I say, my son be acting bad and embarrassing me in these streets. Ooh. What do I do? Yeah, do, and what they, do I do? They, they really just want to do it when people are around. They do. When it's me and him, he like, be around. Right. cool in the car. The but minute people get around... Child, what do you do? Do your kids embarrass you? Oh, when I told you I took a mirror to that conference I had, now this is the number one speakers in the nation, right? I said, Amir, when we get in there, I got to give him a talk in the car. Mom, I got to bring my football. There's no, you're not going to be able to play your football. In the video, you will see him walking with his football. I said, Amir, we're going to a conference. It's in a theater. Well, I, I'm going to be bored, so I need to throw my football at least up in the air. I'm like, just don't hit anything. If you got to bring football, bring, but be good. And I, make sure you greet everybody. Make sure you say hi. And then just go like this with your football. Sit there and be quiet. Okay, as soon as we get in. I'm like, I'm here. You're going to break something. Well, you said I could throw it. No, I said go like this. Throw it to your hands. Your, your hands. These hands right here. And then we get to the back. The people are like, hey, you guys need anything? I'm like, no, I'm good. Just water. Yes. I do. I, I would like a, um, he had a Gatorade. Do you guys have Doritos, but not the regular Doritos, the Doritos that's blue, the Tainos? I don't even know what, they, what it's called. I'm like, Amir, they don't have that here. And they're like, well, I can run out and get it. No, you, no, you can't. No, Amir, just be quiet. He had a whole rider of things he needed. And I'm like, 
You can't just be quiet. It's like, well, they asked. I do want to say. They asked. Exactly. So that's what they so do. So this is what they do. But I think, you uh, know, the Bible talks about be the answer, training, up, training up a child. So that just means he needs to come to more. So... They gonna have to. You have to bring him around more that people. That is what my husband said. You gotta take him out more. You gonna have to he, take him out more. I'm like, yo, that cannot be the answer. That's the I antidote. This I'm telling you, more. You gotta do it more. You gotta do it more. Do you get embarrassed? Yes. Do you feel like, oh my god, these people are gonna see this? You feel that? Yes. Okay, that makes me feel better. Okay. All right. When he threw that ball up, and I was like, if it don't go back to his hand, if it go over there, hit that person in the head, or if it go over there, knock that speaker out, and it was like 600 people in the audience. I was like, why would you decide to be backstage throwing a football in the air? Why? And then I thought, why would I why would you let him bring the football? Why would you do that? Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then I made him put on a button down shirt. This is the thing. I made him put on a button down shirt and I said, you know, wear these nice new white crispy sneakers with your white button down shirt. By the time I get there and I got my video ready to go, he has his Crocs back on. I said, what happened? I just, let's, let's just go in there with the Crocs on. We get in there. When I get off the stage, the shirt, that button-down shirt was off. He got the dingy T-shirt on. The shirt is crumpled up on the side. And then he got his football on. So the white shirt got the football stains on it. So Yandy all pulled together, but her son, look at the son. Look at the son. You know they're going to be like, oh, you, you pulled together. You're embarrassing me in these streets. got your son looking dirty? No, he got I'm, his son looking dirty. That part. That's not how he showed that up here. That ain't how he came. <sighs> yep. So that's just life. Suck <clears> it up. Be embarrassed. But okay. wait till you get your girl. She gonna embarrass me more? Why? Because my daughter is eight, but since she was probably about five, I got that. When they turn around and look at you like this, that's when you like. You don't slap them? Who you? No, you don't slap them because they doing what you do. Oh. My daughter, see, my son is not gonna do this. My daughter will come into a room and sit like this. Uncross your legs. What you doing? What you do, mommy? What you do? And then she want to talk like this. And I'm like, why, why are you talking to me with your hands? What you mean, Mom? Why? What, what's wrong? Mommy, what happened? And you just see yourself. And I'm like... No, thank you. Wow. I don't clap anymore, Skylar. I did that when I lived in New York. We don't clap in Atlanta. Stop clapping, Skylar. And she'd be like, but well, Mommy, what are you talking... I'm like, Skylar. Now we did that in New York. That's the New York life, sis. That's the New York life. We don't do that down here in the A. Wow. I even made a mistake and said, something from sis. She was like, okay, sis, but around people. She gave me the okay, sis, around people. I was like, I'm your mother, don't call me sis. But you call me sis? I was like, <sighs> yeah, wait till you get your girl. Thank you. Yep. I'm not looking forward to any of that. <laughs> that sounds but it's, awful. But it is beautiful. It's a beautiful life. It is. It's a beautiful life. Okay, I haven't gotten to that <laughs> stage yet, but I'm sure it will get there one day. Yes. Pray for me. Um, I have enjoyed this conversation, Me Yandy. Too. I loved every minute of it. I know y'all did too. Y'all felt like y'all was just tuning into a little girl talk. I hope that I asked everything that y'all wanted to know um, because this was juicy yeah. and I appreciated you. I tried to be as authentic and real as possible. You, I mean, you can't be anything else. Yeah. So for the people who are here in Atlanta, where can they get these seafood egg rolls? Ooh. Like, how can they get Yale skincare? That's global, though. Yes. Anywhere with Wi-Fi, yes. right? Anywhere with so Wi-Fi. Let them know. Look right there in that camera and tell okay. the people. So if you are in Atlanta or if you're traveling or you want to travel, make sure you come to Dancing Crepe. We are at the Underground Atlanta, which is 68 Prior Street. Come. And then right next door is the Yale skincare store. But you don't have to be locked into coming to Yale Skincare, the store. You can also order online at www.yelleskincare.com. -E -E yes, we will make sure all of that info is down below in the description. Check out the show notes. Make sure that you share this episode with a friend. All of y'all that thought y'all knew Yandy, y'all ain't on nothing. Y'all ain't, know, y all y all ain't know what I talked today. about here. They gonna learn today, though. You, gonna, you gotta use this as a clip. Listen, today we went deep. I talked about some things I've never spoken about. She asked that real question. Did you really hold it down? And I gave her my real answer. She also asked me, did I want to? And I just give you a hint. I told her no. <laughs> so make sure y'all tune in, because we had some real conversation. Come on, girl, stop playing. Yes. Come on down. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any more bomb episodes. I love y'all, and I'll see you next week. If you enjoyed that episode, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any upcoming content. And take it a step further and go ahead and join our private community over on Patreon because it comes with some pretty bomb perks, including 
early and discounted access to our upcoming events, behind the scene exclusives with some of your favorite guests, the opportunity to call in on an upcoming show, the chance to vote on topics and guests for brand new shows, and I'm even giving you unlimited access to my vault of business classes where I'm teaching you everything from Airbnb to developing digital products and everything in between. And you can get access to our Patreon for as little as $5 a month, okay? Get in where you fit in, and I'll see you on the inside. Peace.